go ahead. Okay, great. <laughs> so um, Empress says, I have a six-year-old. I'm a single mom who also has to work full-time. I'm feeling overwhelmed. Okay, great. Yes, this is um, a, a big thing. I have a three-and-a-half-year-old. I haven't started homeschooling, but I want to start soon. Um, Empress says she's um, overwhelmed and kind of getting stopped with planning and knowing where to start. I have a five and a six year old. We homeschool, but I haven't completely incorporated Waldorf yet, but I really like to. The handicrafts really trip me up since I am not artsy. Oh yes, I have heard that many times. I have an eight, a six, a three, and a two, a meal. Wow. <laughs> I've started with my oldest, not seeing progress. He has some special needs, so I'm just trying to figure it all out. So a lot of you are just trying to figure everything all out, and that's great because that's really what we're here today to talk about the six ingredients to create that nourishing homeschool for your child. And um, I'm gonna go through all this. And so keep typing over there, I'll check back. Um, I think I can kind of leave this chat up. And um, let me go back over here to the slideshow so you can see better. All right, so you're in the right place today if you want to offer a holistic alternative education to your child at home. You might be busy, you don't have tons of time, and you want to make this transition simple, smooth, and pain-free. Like, as I saw many of you guys saying you have more than one child, some of you are working. So it could be like, I really want to do this, but I just don't have the time to figure it all out. You're in the right place if you want to make sure you are covering all the bases and not leaving your child's education to chance. You're in the right place if you'd like a roadmap or a system to follow. But the reality is it can be overwhelming. A Waldorf can seem very overwhelming. There's so many things to learn. There's so many things to kind of figure out. And if you're not artsy or crafty or musical or organized, it can feel like you're really climbing up a mountain. So there are three real homeschooling fears that you might be kind of going through or might have been thinking about. The first one is, what if I can't do this? right? Like, oh my gosh, what if I mess up my kids? And <laughs> what if I can't do this? I don't have the time. Like, I'm so busy. You know, I've got toddlers, one of you said, one of you said you were working. And how do I make this fit into my already very busy days? What if I mess it up and hinder my child's education? What if my child can't get into college or can't, you know, do what they want to do because something I did when they were six? These are very valid points, and I totally remember being there. <laughs> when I started, I was very scared. I, I felt so unsure. I didn't know what I was doing. I felt overwhelmed. There was so much. It felt like so much information, and how do I juggle all of that with my busy lifestyle and my twins and trying to keep the household running? And I so much really wanted the best for my children. I mean, um, I started making their own baby food when they were born and having organic everything in the house. I was so determined that I was going to create this amazing childhood and give them the very best. And when I found Waldorf, I knew that this was something I wanted to do, but I had no idea what I was doing. And I found I was spending all my free time researching how to do it. And back then, this was, now we're talking oh, uh, 12 years ago, <laughs> um, there really was not much online at all about Waldorf. And the things I could find were very much about teachers and classrooms, and it had nothing to do with homeschooling. So I spent a really long time trying to look through um, and, and, you know, tons of things, what I could find, perusing sites. And um, it just felt like I was you know, instead of doing the things I was supposed to be doing with them, I was distracted and doing all this research and I didn't know if I could continue to do it. But I decided my girls' education was the most important thing. I really wanted this for them. So I got some training from teachers and experts and I got help because I realized I didn't want to leave it up to chance. After a while, I realized I had a system and I tweaked that system and I honed that system and it became a step-by-step -step process to really make all of this work smoothly, 
quickly and have something that I can enjoy. I was able to start my own business and have time to do live events, create trainings, and even writing a book. <laughs> Plus, during our school days, we had a lot more time to do fun stuff like sewing, baking, making handmade gifts, painting, and just playing and giving the kids time to do stuff. So we're gonna talk today about the six ingredients to create a nourishing homeschool without it taking all of your time. And this is the time and energy saving way to really make this work in your busy life. So here's what we're gonna talk about and what we're gonna go through on the call today. The number one piece that you must have in place so you can design a peaceful, nourishing environment for your family, and it's not what you think. <laughs> which toys to keep, which ones to purge, and the best way to keep unwanted flashy things from returning to your home, plus ways to politely tell your family to stop buying them. Oh yes, been there, done that how to encourage cooperation with chores and practical work around the home. Also how you can do this with a smile instead of tears, how to bring a Waldorf approach into your life and get your spouse on board and supporting you and how to discover which arts your child is ready for and how to easily weave them into your homeschool and your life, how to set up your homeschool legally, what to do and what not to do. So we've got a lot to cover here. <laughs> Um, so this is um, Michelle, uh, one of my clients who's gone through my programs, and she said, prior to taking Donna's program, I knew very little about Waldorf homeschooling. Now I have the confidence and information to integrate the Waldorf principles into our life. Um, here is Shelly. Shelly was a mom of a toddler, and she said, I knew I needed help and guidance. After just a few weeks, I felt confident I can give my daughter the tools she needs to blossom. Thanks for the phenomenal course. So I want you to imagine this feeling, a feeling like if you went to bed tonight, knowing you could make this work, having a plan to homeschool with confidence and assurance and really just feel like you were ready to go. So let's jump on in here and let's get started. Okay, so we're going to kind of go through these ingredients and I do have a lot. I'm going to try to get through as much as I can, but I could really talk about this stuff all day. We're going, to walk, we're going to go through, I'm going to make sure I'm going to cover everything that I promised, and I'm sure I'm going to give you a lot more here. And then don't forget to hang on because I'm going to be giving you those 10 must-have supplies. I'm going to give you a link to the PDF so that you can have the 10 must-have supplies, and that's coming up in just a few minutes. Okay, so the very first thing you need to do when you're coming to Waldorf is to really understand it, right? You need to understand the theory and the ideas behind the method. So I call it the unfolding child. And in this, we're talking about understanding, um, well, it's understanding Waldorf. I mean, Rudolf Steiner created the, Wal you know, the whole Waldorf schools and, and Waldorf approach way back in the early 1900s. And so there were some things that he stands for, and so maybe there's, there's some things that you've heard a little bit here and there about Waldorf that might seem different or strange, or <laughs> I've heard of some of these things about the seven year cycles and the bodies and the, you know, fourfold and all this. And it can be a little bit confusing and I don't have time to go through all of that. Um, I'm just going to pick a couple things that we're going to go through. But the first thing is to really understand what this method is all about. Because if you don't understand why you're doing what you're doing, it just, it feels wrong to me. <laughs> that was one thing I wanted to learn right away when I was getting started is, what is this all about? You know, who was Rudolf Steiner? And, and why did he create this? And, and what is it supposed to do? Why is it different from Montessori or different from another type of homeschooling? Like, what does Waldorf stand for and what it's all about? So some of this can get really, um, what's the word? <laughs> It's, if you try to read some of Steiner's works, it can get really wordy and confusing. So in my programs, I try to just take the top points and kind of distill it all down so that you'll understand, you know, this is why we do it this way, this is why we do it this way, and I'll go over a couple things here. But basically, the unfolding child is your child's development. Rudolf Steiner created um, Waldorf to meet your child where they are in their developmental stage. And this is one thing I really loved about Waldorf. And it really doesn't 
kind of fall into place until you start to get into the grades. I mean, he recommends and Waldorf kind of has grown into this sort of two um, different areas. One is the early childhood stage. So we're talking about you know, children up to the age of about six, six and a half, where they're preschool, they're not actually in the grades, and then there's stuff recommended for those children. And then when your child starts the first grade, second grade, third grade, and moves up, each year's um, stories and curriculum matches the developmental stages and age of your child. And it's quite amazing the way it was created. And it fits your child so well. The stories are like medicine for their soul. So it's like fairy tales in the first grade. The fairy tales feed your child. They give your child what they need in that first grade. And and each year it progresses on and it's just amazing the way it works and how it works so well. So understanding all of that, understanding where your child is, that um, let's talk briefly about the three seven-year cycles because I think this is something uh, really interesting and um, you've probably heard the terms of hands, heart, and head. And if you haven't, well, I'm going to introduce you to that right now. Um, Steiner believed that the childhood was broken up into three seven-year cycles. So from birth to age seven, that was the first seven-year cycle. And then seven to 14, and then 14 to 21. So they really weren't considered to be fully grown or whatever till after age 21. And I know most of you have young children in the zero to seven, so we're gonna really kind of slant everything over there. But zero to seven is the early childhood phase, and that is the hands. Each of them are connected with those hands. So that's the hands. The second one, seven to 14, is the heart, and the 14 to 21 is the head. So for hands, this is where your child is really just going through development, and they're, they're, um, they're growing into their body. They learn through grabbing things, putting things in their mouth. Think about your toddler and your baby, how they learn by, by testing things, touching things, tasting, climbing, exploring. So it's all about running around <laughs> and moving through their body. So that's the hands aspect where you're really learning through hands, through touching and, and through all of the, the little senses. Then the child moves into the seven to 14 and they're, they're in their heart. Um, their emotions. It's a very emotional time because believe me, I'm just coming out of the second year cycle. My children are getting ready to turn 15. I can't believe it. But they're coming out of that and it was kind of a roller coaster ride. The seven is beautiful, the earlier years. <laughs> and um, they're very into their imagination, imagery, and um, their heart. They just Their heart is just open, wide. They're beautiful beings. And um, then in the 14 to 21, they start to move into their head where they really start to have the intellect come in and start really thinking for themselves. And I see this in my children as they're moving towards that 15 year mark and they start to have a little more rational thought. You can talk to them a little bit more like adults and um, that's where they're thinking and they're, they're that um, upper intellect and, and really brain work and their brain continues to be forming throughout this whole time. So um, that's all about the child development. Um, I also want to talk briefly about mindful parenting because if, when you've got children any age, um, I think it's really important to come from this mindful place and Walter has a great way of um, doing things a little bit different, a little bit more mindful, instead of you know your typical punishments and consequences, Waldorf has a great way of, of doing other things so that you can set up your lifestyle and your children to not have to do so many of those. Uh, I'm kind of like, maybe that sounds confusing, but really being aware of how setting up your rhythm, setting up boundaries in your life, and like setting up your children to not have to um, do so much harsh parenting. This is like a mindful um, kind of looking at things with love, disciplining with love, listening to your child with empathy, really giving them a chance to be a child because we expect a lot from our children. But when you study and learn a little bit about these seven year cycles and a little bit more about their development, we put a lot on our young children, but rational thought does not come or even begin to come into your child's mind until they're 14 years old. So if you're expecting your child to be like, what were you thinking when you did that? You know, that's the way we think as adults. But 
looking at your five-year-old or your seven-year-old, they're not thinking about, oh, I shouldn't do this because of the consequences. They sometimes do things and they don't know why they do things. So it changes the perspective by really understanding where a child's coming from, why they do what they do, and um, really giving them a chance to, um, you know, they're not going to, you know, you're not going to let them go hog wild and do crazy stuff without any kind of discipline. But I think understanding why they do what they do and helping them stay within boundaries um, is a great way to parent. And we talk a lot about this in my programs. Waldorf speak. Um, that's my term <laughs> that I created for, have you ever heard these Waldorf kindergarten and first graders speak? You probably haven't, but if you have, it would just be something amazing. They're very soft spoken. They don't say, I've told you four times to come over here. It's time for lunch. <laughs> you know, they ring a little bell. And so I'm going to give you a tip here. Talk less and do more. So if you are saying, this is the third time I've told you something, or you're raising your voice or whatever, children don't respond to that, but you could whisper like this, and suddenly they turn to look at you, right? So it's all about talking less, doing, using little bells. We have this, um, what I call the dinner bell. It's just one of those triangle, like a musical triangle that you have like a little, uh, you know, stick, a, a metal stick that, to ring it. And actually I, I lost the stick, so I just used like a knife. <laughs> And I could be calling everyone to dinner and calling them and calling them and no one comes. I, I ring the bell and they come. And it still works, even as I have teenagers now. So there's a whole bunch of this. I wish we had more time to go into it, but I'm just kind of giving you a peek into these six ingredients and what it means. Okay, this was the mindful parenting, creating a loving, warm bond. It's more important to create this loving, warm bond with your child and really um, form this, especially when you start thinking about your child moving into the preteen years. I can tell you from example, you want your child to be open and talk to you because when they're five and seven and eight and 10, it's all great. But when they start to move into those preteen years, you want to have a connection with your child that's strong and that will um, support you guys through these very crazy uh, preteen and teen years. And I know I'm not through the whole thing and we've already gone through some bumpy times, but one thing I can say is that we have a very open relationship. My girls come to me and tell me things that I'm shocked that they still do, but I'm so thankful that I took the time to create this bond of trust and that I listen to them so that they'll come to me and they and I'll and I can help them through these bumpy times. Okay, let's move on to the second ingredient and that is environment. So this is basically everything where your child's going to be, <laughs> right? So I included simplifying your home, toys, and play. So simplifying your home um, is a great way and and many of you probably already do this but sometimes we have so much clutter and we have so many things around it's nice to clean things out and have a home that um, has space and some energy for your child to play and for you to live and not have like rooms cluttered up with you know one of those catch-all rooms where you shove everything or their child's room where you can barely open the door because there's clothes and toys and books scattered everywhere. It's very hard for your child to feel comfortable and play in an environment where there's so much stuff and there's so much coming at them. These children, especially that zero to seven age range, um, are very sensitive. They're very sensitive to everything that comes in. And I'm sure you've heard this before that before age seven, children can't filter things. They can't say, oh, you know, if they start hearing some crazy stuff on the news or they hear you talking about a very um, adult type topic, it's hard for them. And so, you know, you may have some issues from things that you're working through that you heard when you were young or a situation that happened because you can't filter it out. So we want to protect our children as much as possible from those things in these early years. So simplifying their home, having it nice and warm, soft lighting, soft music, not a lot of loud, banging, bashing, constant noise, television blaring, stereo blaring, you know, loud talking. I mean, you know, if your family's loud, we are definitely a loud family. We talk and laugh and everything, but then there's many times where it's just quiet in the house. I never had like TV running or music playing all day. It was just quiet. 
and I would do some work and my children would be playing and I would hear the, you know, the, the noises of them playing and their laughter or whatever. So there's a whole thing behind this, <laughs> really simplifying. But one tip I could give you here to get started is to, um, you know, clean up your child's room. I did this and it was amazing. I went in my kid's room when I was simplifying our home and I went room by room and did every room, but we started with the kid's room and I thought I was already really good at paring things down and an organized person. I don't have a lot of junk around, but I looked in their room and I thought, I wonder why they never take all these books, take some books off the shelf. And then I looked and there was like three shelves filled with books. So this is before they could read, but even just taking picture books. And I opened their closet and, you know, they each had like 20 shirts, 30 pairs of pants. It was crazy. So I pared everything down. You know, we have our favorite clothes that we wear and they have their favorite clothes. So I pared it down. And that way it was easy to pick, you know, the red shirt, the blue shirt or the green shirt, you know, that kind of a thing. I pared it down to their 10 favorite books and I set a little beanbag chair in their room with a with a little um, area rug. And suddenly they were in there. It was clean. It was um, feeling it was open and they started like pulling books off the shelf and reading them or looking through them and really playing in their room where they hadn't before. So let's talk to, touch on toys because this is one of the things that I um, have to talk to you about and that is which toys to keep and which to purge. So obviously we're going for natural, handmade, um, real natural toys. So we're talking about wooden toys, silk, toys, anything that's, you know, hand sewn and really trying to stay as much away from the plastic, sharp, pointy, edged toys. Um, we're looking for more open-ended toys like, and they don't even have to, be, when I say toys, they don't necessarily have to be toys. In fact, I remember my mom coming over when my kids were, you know, pretty young, I'm probably five or something. And I remember her coming into the living room and looking around and she's like, your kids don't have any toys. You know, she was ready to go down to Walmart and buy some toys. And I said, they have plenty of toys. You know, she's looking in our bins and I had everything in organized in little baskets. And they had, there was a basket of uh, tree blocks that my husband literally went into the backyard and, and cut for free out of a nice fallen log those tree blocks I still have. They don't play with them anymore, but they are in perfect condition after 10 years <laughs> of hard use. Um, nuts, acorns, walnuts, shells, sticks, you know, any little things like that. This is what my kids played with. They were very open-ended. They could be food for the animals. They could be money. They could be stepping stones. It could be anything. So those are the type of things I'm talking about. Some play silks, that had a basket of play silks, which we still have. They would take those play silks and they would become, you know, things to wear, things to wrap around their horses, you know, scenes on floors, like the water, if it was a blue silk or uh, ground, if it was a brown silk. So those kind of things, Tinker Toys is one thing that they did have that they used and they were fantastic. But they are, they are, they were the wooden ones, not the plastic ones. There were a few little plastic pieces, but most of them were wooden. And they were very open-ended and my kids used the heck out of Tinker Toys. So I can recommend those as an excellent toy. Anything that looks scary, um, you know, they had a couple scary dragons that I, they did play with once in a while, but I tried to stash them away. So anything that looks harsh, and you know what I'm saying here. Um, most of the Waldorf toys are very um, smooth, rounded edges. The facial, The faces are very simple. Um, there's not a ton of detail on most of it. It's very open-ended. So, you know, this horse could be this or that. Um, they're very, um, they're, they're great to hold. Uh, if you can take a plastic toy in your hand and then take a wooden toy, like one of the little wooden uh, animals or something from the Waldorf style toys and hold them, you'll see the difference. I saw this in my knitting when I had first started to learn to knit. I had a, um, a plastic needle or maybe it was a metal needle. And then someone showed me that they had um, wooden needles and actually I think they're bamboo. And once I had the bamboo and the wooden needles, I was like, oh my gosh, these feel amazing in my hand. So I thought if it feels good for me to knit it too, how great does it feel for my kids to play with? 
So um, I would say purge anything that's broken or that's really, we had a few flashy toys that I had gotten before I had even discovered Wal uh, Waldorf with batteries and they played music and flashing and everything. So, um, you know, try to kind of put those, you know, in a stash them away and hopefully your jaw will um, forget about them. There's a whole thing on trying to kind of rotate. Sometimes you have to rotate the toys and if they are gifts or something from a grandmother, you know, you may have to put them in a box and I try to stash them and have them out of sight, out of mind. But if they asked for them, then I would bring them out for a short time and then I would put them away. They, cause my mom would still insist on getting them like Barbie computers and, and Barbie dolls and things like that. And I would just let them play with them for a few days and then I would tuck them away and they would forget about them. So, um, I think the best way to stop the unwanted coming in is just to be upfront. And this is what I did with my family. I, even though I had to continue to keep doing it, just tell them what you're trying to do. Just tell them you're trying to bring only natural open into toys. You don't want anything with batteries or electronics if possible. Um, now it's even harder. I mean, when my kids were younger, you know, there was no such thing as iPads and iPhones. So I know it's even harder these days to get around that. Um, but try the younger the child, the more you, I, sh I would recommend enforcing this. So the younger the child, the more open-ended, soft, yummy, <laughs> natural play things. And then as they get a little bit older, you can start introducing some things if they haven't already been introduced. Just politely tell them that this is what you're doing. And what I found to be really helpful is to um, go to one of the websites. Um, I think Bella Luna Toys has it. Um, What's the other one? Um, I'll think of it. They have toy regist. They have registries. So go online and register for some toys and things that you want because that was my biggest problem I had with my mom. I don't know what to buy your kids. I can't just go to Walmart or Toys R Us and get something. So I gave her some websites and I said, go to these websites and just pick something and it'll be shipped directly to our house. You don't have to worry about going out and then I'll get what I want. You'll, it'll be easy for you. So those, a lot of those have gift registries. You can just register for all the things you want. And then each holiday, send the link to your family if they need some ideas and want to buy something or even you. I did this for my own, what I want kind of as a, you know, your wish list, <laughs> and then you can purchase. Um, so I hope that helps that. Um, another thing I want to talk about is, um, well, of course, play is a big part of your child's um, day, is to have that indoor and outdoor play set up so that they can play, play, play. That's really your, your job, your child's job in these early years is to learn through playing. So playing is a big part, but there's also a piece of playing that I want to talk about, and that is the practical work. So you've probably heard about this, where your child um, is really coming in to help you. So instead of you going, okay, stay over here and play right now, I have to go do the laundry. You invite your child to come with you, and these kids at this age want to help. And I promise you when your kids to be get to be teenagers, as helpful as they was in, they were in the early years, they don't want to help you anymore. So take advantage of it now. And I know it's easier said than done. I know it takes a lot longer when you do have them come help you, but it really pays off. My kids learned how to, they were making their beds somewhat, and I say making their beds in quotations, pulling up their covers when they were three. And they were getting themselves dressed and they were, you know, helping around the house, learning to fold laundry. They want to help. And I know it'll take a little bit longer, but it's very important that they feel like they're part of something and they're part of the family unit. They're part of helping around the house. And so get, if you just, you know, maybe even get them a small broom if you want. You don't have to. We never, I don't think I ever got like little brooms or little, oh yeah, I think we had a little dustpan and broom that they had. They would help. But you can give them just a dust rag and ask them to go around and dust or help them water the plants, help them plant plants in the garden. My kids learned how to do, I was a, I'm a very avid gardener and my kids learned to garden very young and they're very helpful and they're very good at it. They learn pretty fast. So this practical work, this is how you encourage it. You bring them along with you and the kids will want to do it instead of 
you forcing them to do chores. It's just like working with you and they'll want to help you. So that's very, it, they're imitating you and that practical work is part of their play. They love it. I mean, I'm not saying that they're going to be standing with you the whole day doing all your work because they're not. They'll stay with you for a few minutes and then they'll run back and go play and that's fine. But you want them to help. You want them to be involved if they want and encourage them. Here's, you know, a few towels that they can fold or here's, you know, the, the napkins to put on the table. Um, or wash a few vegetables. Here, come stand beside me while I'm cooking and you can wash these vegetables in this tub in the sink. There's a lot of things. And instead of you trying to figure out what am I going to do with the kids while I bake and cook, bring them on in if you can and have them help you in a small way. That's not going to, you know, obviously make sure they're not going to be burned or cut or something. But, um, and you're right there, but give them little jobs to help them um, become part of feeling like they're wanted and needed and they're you're giving them amazing skills. My children can do so many things. They know how to do everything around the house, bake, cook, clean. So, <laughs> you know, all the handwork and everything. So um, it's important. Um, okay, great. I got to keep going here. I'm never going to get through this. <laughs> okay. Number three ingredient is rhythm. And I am such a big advocate of rhythm. So if you're unfamiliar with this term, it's really the scheduling of your days and weeks. This is a sort of a Waldorf term. It's, you know, usually you might think rhythm is like a musical term, but in Waldorf rhythm means the, um, you know, how your days flow. It's not like scheduling out in a calendar, but it's the flow of your days. And we'll talk briefly about the in and out breath. And that, just think of a tide. You know, it comes in and it goes out. And it comes in and it goes out. And that's the, that is the um, type of flow that you're looking for throughout the day. So there are certain activities that you do with your children that are an in-breath activity and certain that are out-breath. So go running and playing outside is a very out-breath, right? Coming and listening to a story is an in-breath. So you want to have a flow. If you have a ton of out-breath activities, and I'm sure you've experienced this with your child, where they're like going, 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 and then they get like crazy and they can't come down out of it, like they're so wound up, um, it's that they've had too much out breath and then you've also experienced it where they've been sitting for a long time Maybe in a car or something and they are just wiggles and they can't sit still and they're about to go crazy and explode That's too much in breath So you want to have your day set up where this is in breath out breath kind of a, a balance of what's going on and it's very important to get the um your ideal day set up i'm i have a lot of programs to set up your rhythm because i think it is really the number one thing that you need to put in place to create this peaceful nourishing environment and before you even start homeschooling your lessons you need a good rhythm to your days because if you don't have that and then you want to add in homeschooling too it's it can be too chaotic if you have every day is different if every day the schedule varies if every night your child is going to bed at a different time and there's no set morning routine and you're just flying by the seat of your pants, it's very hard on your child. Children thrive on consistency. They want to know what's coming next. It helps them settle into the world and feel like there's some type of security. And not only that for you, it's amazing when you have a nice rhythm set up because you don't have to think, oh my gosh, what's next? And what am I going to do over here? And what's the meal going to be? And oh my gosh, the kids aren't in bed yet. And it's nine o'clock. It becomes like an autopilot. I mean, it's sort of a set it and forget it once you get things going. And it takes all of that off you. You don't have to have this crazy, oh my gosh, feeling like you're trying to play catch up. You'll have the rhythm going and then all you have to do is go, oh, we have a little pocket of time this afternoon. Let's go paint or let's go to the park or let's go to the beach. So it takes away all of that craziness and really frees your mind up to be present with your child and to do the fun things instead of you just feeling like I have to figure out what's going next. Once that's all done, you've created your ideal day, you've created the pillars of the day, it really frees you up. It's the best, it's like the best thing. It's the first thing I teach when I'm teaching people, other than understanding, um, you know, what Waldorf is about, then getting their rhythm in place is the very first thing I, I work with when I work with clients and in my programs. It's very important, I, I believe. It's one of the most important things, and it's amazing to have your daily rhythm and your, your weekly rhythm set up. Now, it doesn't mean that every day is gonna be exactly the same and nothing's ever gonna go wrong, 
But if you have a nice strong rhythm, it's a lot easier to get back on track and you don't have to be so scheduled and, and rigid. It actually frees you from that. And I, I'm not a real, hey, I have to do everything by the clock kind of a thing because you don't want that. You want it to be flowing. And when you have this flowing rhythm in and out breath, um, it feels so nourishing and so relaxing. Um, even if you've got a three-year-old and a five-year-old and you're not really officially schooling, you still need this rhythm. And I had a really great rhythm going. And when it was time to actually start doing our first grade, it was seamless. We just added main lesson in and I thought, wow, I was afraid everything was going to change and all now we have to do school. But it worked out great because I had an awesome rhythm in place. We just added one little piece to it and we just kept going. It was like, oh. So it's just like what we've always, you know, already been doing, only we do a little bit of more over here. So it was really, really nice to have that rhythm. And so I highly recommend getting that rhythm in place. All right, we're going to stop just for a second. And, and what time should a child under seven go to bed? Just wonder what your thoughts are over here. And I'm going to pop over to the chat. What time should your child go to bed? <laughs> I'm going to pop over here. So let me pull up the um, chat. 7 p.m., someone said. Okay, great. 7, we are early bed folks. Great. Okay, yes, definitely. I'd say 7, 7.30. We try to stick to 7.30. Okay, excellent. 7 to 8, good. If your child is going to bed at 8 and 9 and 10 o'clock, um, I mean, they could probably be, they're probably still sleeping in the morning till late 9 and 10 o'clock. Usually that's the way it goes. But it, it doesn't give you any time as an adult to have that evening. I remember going, oh my gosh, it's almost seven o'clock, it's almost seven o'clock, just hang on for another 30 minutes, right? And then we would have story and they would be lights out by 7.30, so. You've got time to be yourself and regenerate yourself and we're gonna talk about that in one of the upcoming um, ingredients here, but it's really important to have a, a pretty strict bedtime, like I don't care if it's seven o'clock or 7.30, but stick to that. Like I was such a stickler for bedtime. My kids slept great. We never had issues with it. And um, even if we were out of town or something, I'm like, or we had to go out to dinner, I'm like, well, we're gonna have to go out to dinner early because we have to get them home and be in bed at 7.30. And my husband would be like, okay. But it worked. And then I had the evenings free because I needed that time, especially when you've got several young children you as a mom need that time to recover <laughs> and kind of go, okay, I can just be Donna for a little while, or I can be myself for a while, or I can connect with my spouse if you're married, or I can read a magazine, or I can watch Netflix, or I could do whatever I want to do, you know, have some wine and sit on the back porch that is not involving, you know, children. You need a little bit of a break. So I highly recommend that, um, having that in face. All right, let's pop back over here to the slideshow. Okay, let's move into ingredient number four, which I know some of you expressed at the beginning was sort of a challenge for you. And that is the arts or creative expression. So we're gonna talk about age appropriate arts here. And um, you know, it's hard because I can't talk to each person individually, but I'm just gonna give you sort of an age range of what you know your child can do and what can't do, what they what what they might be a little bit young doing. Probably a lot of you are were very drawn into Waldorf because of the arts, right? The beautiful paintings and the drawings, um, and the singing and the movement, the music and all of that is really important. Um, and it's like, okay, this is great. And because that's what not kids are not getting those right out in the, in the regular schools, you know, that's the first thing to go is the arts programs and you want to have this. So it's really important. And there are so many studies out there to, um, you can look easily Google this about how the arts help in later upper academics and math and science and reading and all of that, how it, how music creates connections in the brain. I'm sure you guys have heard of that whole um, Mozart theory and all of that. Um, but it is true. Music and movement is a way of expressing your child's expressing themselves, learning that of the goodness in the world and just, you know, kids love, I, I know the younger kids, you, you guys have them. They just, they don't, they don't feel shy about dancing or singing. They just do it because it feels good because they love it. And so we want to get into that. We want to give them more opportunities to have that. And Waldorf is really based on storytelling and the arts. I mean, it, it's, that is the, these are the vehicles 
through which Waldorf comes to your child. You know, there's no textbooks and workbooks and that kind of a thing. It's all done through stories, through paintings and drawing and singing and movement music and all of these things. That is how you deliver, if you will, the Waldorf method is through the arts. So it is important that you know a little bit. Now you don't have to be, you know, a super singer or Van Gogh or something in order to do it. Here's a, a piece of advice that I want to give you. Um, as you only have to be one step ahead of your child. So if you have a five-year-old or a six-year-old or eight-year-old or whatever age, you only have to be one step ahead of where they are with it. So I take a deep breath with that and think about what I'm saying. Okay, even with the handwork and all of that, you, you only have to know a tiny bit more. And this came into play with me when I was doing handwork. I grew up um, my grandmother did show me how to crochet. So I did have that, but I had never learned to knit. I didn't know how to do it. And I'm like, Ugh, it kept getting closer to the time to first grade when I knew I had to, you know, teach my kids to knit. So I said, I'm going to have to go learn. And it was a little bit of a challenge for me, I will say. Now I love it, but it took a while. And I thought, oh my gosh. But then I thought, well, I know more than they know, and so I, I can teach them the, ver the basics. They actually far exceed me and learned you know, quickly and bypassed me when it came to knitting. But you only have to be one step ahead. So let's look at some ages. So I think you know, under the age of two, it, you know, a lot of these things you, you're gonna have to wait. So singing and movement, let me go back here. Um, singing, movement, and storytelling and you know some basic drawing or whatever it can be any age right i mean singing we start singing to our kids when they were when they're young and they can sing so singing can be brought into any day while you're while you're doing circle time if you're doing circle that's a perfect you know way to do singing while you're cooking breakfast and your kids are there with you you could be singing some songs while you're driving in a car you could sing while you're walking outside or in the, you know, doing chores. I know there's a great CD collection and I highly recommend these. We had them called um, Naturally You Can Sing. If you go to the Naturally You Can Sing website, they have some great CDs there. Now, you need to s learn them and sing them to your child. I played the CDs some, but mostly I would learn the CD, learn the song, and then I would sing them without the music. You can do both. But Waldorf recommends singing from you instead of singing from CDs because the music is condensed, it's comp compacted down. That's what a CD is, right? It's a compact disc. And it's not the same as live music. And kids love to hear you sing. And I don't care if you sound terrible or you think you don't, you know, you're no good. Kids are not judging you. They just love that you're having a good time. They're not sitting there going, oh my gosh, my mom sounds like a, a cow stuck in the mud. They just love that you're laughing and having a good time and they'll jump right in with you. So sing, sing, sing. That can be done at any age. Uh, movement is the same thing. You know, dancing and doing finger plays and running around and doing little um, games. All of that dancing and moving and pretending to be a tree and all of those. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of the same as the singing. Anybody can do it at any age, so your child can start doing that. And some of these crafts can even start to come in um, at a young age if you're helping, you know, doing, um, you know, depending if there's a lot of cutting and, you know, some crafts you can easily do with the younger ones. Um, now, handwork, um, I think, uh, you know, as you get closer to age five, your child can start like wrapping yarn. Like that's one thing. If you buy a skein of yarn that's not rolled or you haven't, don't have it rolled tight into a ball, they can wrap. Um, my kids used to get out the tinker toys and, and tie yarn to them and pretend that they were um, knitting. Um, they can start finger knitting around age five. So that's an, you can check YouTube. There are videos out there on how to finger knit. So you can start the finger knitting. They can wet felt. Um, at that age, three to five, and of course up. Um, and of course, painting with just a few, with one color, they can, you know, depending on how your child, you know, will hold a brush and how long they'll stay with you, all those things can get started. Some of the things that you might see later on, like these beautiful paintings and things, it's going to be a little bit older child before they're doing a lot of those drawings and chalkboard drawings for you. Um, and some of those paintings, you know, we're talking about a child that's more like seven, eight, and nine. 
and really getting into knitting and knitting doesn't start till age seven in the first grade and then second grade is um, crocheting and then they do weaving and, and moving up in there so you've got to be a little patient with some of this playing a blowing instrument there's a picture of our us doing the recorder starts in first grade my kids had some little things before but I didn't do any official lessons until we were in first grade so you can bring in a lot of these things already into your home and then um, start preparing yourself like I did to learn how to do some of these things like the needle felting, the wet felting, and um, the, the handwork as you go. So um, maybe you can tell me which arts you're really excited about and what you can't wait to get started with. You can also tell me which arts are kind of challenging for you, which arts are like, oh my gosh, I can't paint to save my life and I have no idea how to do that wet almond fitting. But let me tell you, if a six-year-old and a seven-year-old can learn it, you as an adult can learn it. It's not hard, you just need to know the techniques to do it. And again, you only need to be one, um, one step ahead of where your child is. So, okay, we talked about this, which art is your, ready, is your child ready and how to weave them into the days. Okay, let's move on. Setting up your homeschool, number five. So this is a lot here. This is like going through the legal requirements of you know, your state or wherever you are located, your country, because every state in the United States is different. And I know every country has different laws. So you have to be responsible for finding out what your laws are, because what my laws are here are different from where you are. So you have to find that out. You can check with a local um, support uh, homeschool co-op and ask some people. Um, some of the other things for setting up your homeschool is, you know, what materials and supplies you're going to need. And again, I'm going to be giving you that link shortly here for the top 10 must-have supplies, choosing a curriculum, and then planning and presenting your lessons. So let's talk about legal requirements for just a minute here. Um, how to homeschool legally. A really nice website is the HL, hslda.org, and that's the homeschool legal Defense Association or something like that. Um, there, you can choose by state and and look. And I know there's one for international. With uh, if you go to the international, there's also one for that. So you can start looking right now or find out. Because a lot of times, like what I found out in South Carolina, is that I don't officially have to start homeschooling until my kids were seven. So I was like, oh, well, I've got a couple years. I don't have to worry about any type of legal whatever I have to do and tracking anything or whatever I it kind of took me off the hook and I think a lot of states it's the same so um, Check to see what you can do what you can't do um, some states require um, You know homeschooling five days a week some just say it has to be 180 days You know really look to see because some states are very strict I want to say New York and Pennsylvania are a little more just strict and then like South Carolina, it's really nothing. You don't have to do a whole lot of, they don't really, you know, there's not a whole lot of restrictions. So it's really important to find out before you start moving into planning and getting into the grades, um, what your, you know, what your locality's rules are so that you make sure that you're abiding by them and you're not gonna get in trouble or whatever for that. So, um, Let's go back here just for a second. And that is, um, so materials and supplies, that's like all of, you know, what do I need to have? Like main lesson books, crayons, like what do I need to have? And then curriculum, do I need a curriculum for, you know, the preschool, kindergarten age? I do, I do like to have some kind of something to follow. I don't consider it to be a real curriculum. There's no academics, but it's more of a seasonal curriculum. And I have the School for All Seasons that I, um, it's just a kind of, organizing everything into a circle and into weekly themed lessons so that you can follow it if you want to. And there's something to do with your five-year-old and your four-year-old and your six-year-old so that you're not like, what do we do all day? <laughs> it gives you something to follow. And then planning because you have to figure out, okay, how long is this going to take? How do I present these lessons to my child? Do I, how do I tell these stories? How do I do the paintings? And how do I do the chalkboard drawings? And how do I set everything up? So that's the setting up your homeschool. But the very first thing and probably what most of you guys need to do is to look at the legal requirements. So that's why we covered that.
All right, let's go on to the last ingredient and then I can kind of go over there and, and tell you about a resource that I'm gonna tell you about and then we're gonna do questions and answers. So the very last, and I don't mean it as far as last, but the very last one we're gonna talk about is inner work and self-care for moms. This is really an important way, an important thing to have in place because you are with your kids 24 seven for the most part and now you're homeschooling and you can get really tired and if you're not taking care of yourself, and you guys already know this, I'm sure, if you're not taking care of yourself and recharging yourself, then um, and you're exhausted, you're not going to be a very effective homeschool teacher. So um, you've got to get some help. You've got to have some grounding for yourselves. Maybe do some meditation and um, set some boundary for yourself because we're so quick to say yes to everything. We wanna help everything. We wanna help everyone because we're moms and we're women. And we say, yes, 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 we'll do this, we'll do this. And then we end up um, you know, spreading ourselves too thin with all the things we have to do. And it just, be we become resentful and we, we realize we can't do everything and we just kinda of wanna break down. So it's really important for us to, um, to have things for ourselves, and that's what I was saying, like that bedtime is really important. So one of the best ways to recharge yourself is to find something that you love. So think back before kids, when you were a teen, or whenever it was before kids came along, or maybe you just have a hobby that you really love right now. So for me, it was like gardening. I love gardening. I was a, uh, I'm a master gardener. I did organic garden design. This is before the kids came along. So I love it, and when I get outside and I start getting in the garden, I could spend hours out there. So that's the type of thing where you kind of lose yourself. So maybe it's yoga, maybe it's painting, I don't know, whatever it could be for you. It could be just reading or taking a hot bath. I know the younger children, the harder this is going to be to set things aside for yourself, but it's really important that you, you have these things in place. I remember going through a stage my kids were pretty young. They were probably about three and having three-year-old twins is really hard. And I remember when my husband would come home, I just wanted to leave. I just wanted to get out. Like I, I needed a break and I would go to the grocery store by myself and just walk around up and down the aisles without being distracted. I could think, I could plan meals without just getting a whole bunch of stuff that didn't make any kind of a meal. And nobody was throwing stuff in the cart or crying and all of that. So I was like, I just needed some time. So I suggest putting something into your schedule once a week. You know, can you have coffee with friends? Can you have a date night with your husband or your boyfriend? Can you get, you know, something to do for yourself? Because just like they tell you on the plane, if you don't give that oxygen to yourself, you won't be able to help others. And it's the same thing. We run out of gas. We go, 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 go. We try to help everyone. We try to do everything. And then eventually the car is going to break down and you are going to break down. So you really want to have some things in place. So the first thing I could say is find a hobby or something that you love and try to pencil it in once a week, once a day, depending on what it is. Like it could be just a 10 minute yoga routine that you do in the mornings, getting up early in the morning and doing your yoga routine. Or it could be the once a week going out with friends and having coffee something to put into your routine to recharge yourself. You will become a better mom, a better spouse, a better parent. And it seems counterintuitive, but it happens every time I would like take a little trip or go away for a little while and come back. I was much better because I feel like I've gotten myself taken care of. I'm not feeling resentful that I never have any time for myself. And I hope it doesn't sound selfish because that's not the way I'm trying to come across, but you do need to take care of yourself. You matter and you are one of the ones that you have to take care of with all the rest of your family. You have to put yourself in there. And so if you're not doing anything and you come last every time, um, that can't be sustained. And that'll start coming out, you know, in your personality and you'll be snipping and you'll be mad. And, and um, I, I really want you to get this. So there's a whole lot more that goes along with this inner work, but I just want to give you that piece um, before we move along. So um, here's Catherine. This is one of my clients. And she said, for my first year of the grades, it was very helpful for me to have a mentor to help me see the flow of the process. I appreciate the push to help me see how to go about planning in an organized and proficient way. 
So that's just someone who had gone through my programs and I worked with um, who was going through the first grade. So I'm not sure what you showed up today to learn or why you showed up. Maybe you were tired of feeling overwhelmed. And I know a lot of you at the beginning said you were feeling overwhelmed and you really want a map to follow instead of leaving it up to chance. You want to know that your bases are covered and that you're doing it correctly so your child will learn and thrive and really be nourished through this holistic type of education and really, you know, kind of be encased in this Waldorf world uh, where they can have the best of, of what they need for their childhood. If you'd rather spend time with your child doing fun stuff, playing and enjoying your time rather than researching and trying to figure it out, like it's hard enough to do this, it's not an easy thing. I mean, it's a lot easier to use a different kind of homeschool where you just, you know, have your child sign up online and today's lessons is right here. You don't have to do a lot. This Waldorf approach is very mom centric and it is a lot. You are the teacher and you are the one that they're going to be learning through. So hats off to you for doing it. But if you have to try to figure it out and then do it, it's a lot. <laughs> so, if you value a solid plan and training and realize to be the most effective, you're going to need some guidance on how to do it. You don't have to have it, but it's gonna take a lot longer and it's gonna be a lot harder if you don't. So if it's time for you to step into your role as homeschool teacher with confidence, assurance, and excitement, like a joy, like I can't wait. I, I had this feeling every morning, like I couldn't wait to go and start homeschooling because it was so much fun. My girls were having so much fun doing it and they were learning so much. It was just like the best years of my life with them. It was just amazing. It's your chance to do this for your child now. I know you can do it. You only need a plan and a little help to get started. If I can do it and I didn't even have a plan until I kind of figured it all out, you can do it. So I want to introduce a resource that I am so excited about. And this is sort of um, another program that I had. I've revamped and kind of, I keep making it better and changing it to make it really, really spectacular. And this is the Waldorf Homeschool University. It's a 12 month training and support program to walk you through the A to Z of everything that has to do with Waldorf. Like all these ingredients that we talked about and much more are going to be taught through the university. And if you want more information and you want to go to the info page, the link is you can just go to the waldorfconnection.com forward slash university. So pretty simple to find it over there. So here's what it's all about. And I am so excited. This is going to be like one of our best programs ever. You get two trainings per month. So we're going to drip trainings to you in the order that I think you need them and really it's it's like taking a step each little training is going to move you to the next step move you to the next step and giving you time in between to digest the information and then move on to the next so we're going to walk you gently through every step through this 12 month program so here are the trainings and here are the I, I just kind of broke it down by months so month one we're going to talk all about a lot of this, you're going to see what I talked about today a little bit. The unfolding child, you're going to get all about Steiner's um, theory, the distilled down version so that it makes sense to you and it, as it pertains to homeschooling and not just trying to read everything Steiner. You'll learn all about your child's developmental stages and how you can support them and what you can do to help and, and really understand where your child is. And then the second one that month is about Waldorf discipline, disciplining with love and empathy and parenting, that whole Waldorf speak thing I talked about and how to come from the Waldorf side and a mindful side. Month two is all about simplifying your home. And I talked about the environment and really making a, um, taking into account the sensitivity of your child and really creating um, a nice environment. And uh, the second one is circle time. How to do circle time, all about circle time and you know, watching a video on us doing circle time so you can actually see. Month three is all about rhythm. So that the both um, trainings that month, it's a rhythm part one and rhythm part two. So we're gonna really go deep into rhythm and I'm gonna help you step by step create your daily and your weekly rhythm so that you can have uh, on this in-out breath, relaxing, 
non-chaotic day where you know what's happening and everything's put into place. And month four, we're going to talk about your child's job, which is that play, all about play, how to set up indoor play, outdoor play, tips on toys, on uh, materials, purposeful work, imitation, what they can do, what they can't do, everything about all the toys and materials for playing and what your child needs to really thrive. Month five is all about inner work. <laughs> like we just talked about self-care, how to do things, how to do things in a mindful way, how, with the meditations that you'll need and how to um, really ground yourself so that you'll be the best teacher and mom that you can be. And also your role as the teacher, how you step up into that role and how you can prepare yourself to be the best because teachers go to school for years, right? <laughs> if you're going to college or whatever to become a teacher, you're there for years learning. And now you're just thrown in here. And so I want to give you a little bit of, hey, how do I do this? What do I do? <laughs> so that you're not just thrown into it. Month six is all learning about through the arts, how important it is, why and what your child is learning as they're going through the arts. Uh, and again, B is the, uh, all about singing, the month six and seven is basically all the arts. I'm going to be going through showing you each one. You're going to get videos of each one on how to do all of this, singing, the music, blowing instrument. And then month seven, drawing, chalkboard, drawing, painting, um, the handwork, the storytelling, puppet shows, and um, including felting and everything. So you're going to get all of that. We're going to go through step by step through all of it. And month eight, about festivals. We didn't talk about that today, but festivals and nature tables and using the seasons and nature as your curriculum. I'll get back to that in a few minutes. Month nine, preparing to homeschool, the legal steps, the myths to homeschooling, how to bust through those myths. You know, is it really important to be socialized and all those things that your husband and your family are asking? Um, how to find support role models and meeting with others so you're not isolated, creating you know co-ops and support groups. So I really wanna get you moving now into the homeschool part. Month 10 is homeschool supplies, how to choose curriculum, setting up your homeschool, getting again some more support and getting your family on board. Month 11 is on planning lessons and presenting the lesson. So all I'm planning and presenting, how do I do an, a main lesson? What do I do here? Month 12 is on homeschooling with multiple children or only children. And then we're going to talk about pop culture, how to kind of keep away from whatever you, all the other kids are doing and electronics, which is a huge, huge topic. So we're going to have fun over there. So that's just the monthly topics. You'll also get two monthly coaching calls with me, open calls where you can come ask whatever you want twice a month. So if you can't, you know, make one, you can come to the other, all the calls are recorded and it's going to be like, you know, whatever you want to talk about that regards to anything that we're talking about. So it could be something, you know, regarding the latest training. It could be questions about anything. I'll be there to ask, answer them um, twice a month. You get four quarterly intensives. So four times a year, we're going to do deep dives into one of these rhythm and scheduling main lesson toys and electronics and circle time where we're going to go like an extra little live thing where you can see me doing it or I'll bring in it, um, someone in to demonstrate and we're going to really go deep into these so that you can make sure you have it and you don't have any questions about it. There's a community Facebook forum where you get to be as part of the university. You can you're, you come into the forum and people share pictures over there of their homeschools. Um, whatever you're working on, you'll get to know other people so you can ask questions and really be part of the community and feel like you're not the only one. Being isolated is a real big challenge, I know, for Waldorf homeschoolers, homeschoolers in general, but for Waldorf homeschoolers, they're sort of this little redhead stepchild over here. And so I want you to feel like you have other people you can come ask information from and not feel like you're the only one doing it. You'll get my core training programs besides the monthly. There are a few core training programs you get immediately when you come in. And these are the Rhythm and Organizational Strategy Day, How to Homeschool, Nourishing the Early Years, and Practical Magic. I want you guys to have everything. So for those who are like, I want to jump right in, I want to learn everything, I need to know this stuff right now, you'll get these programs, and then the other stuff will be dripped out to you. They're different than these, and it will be going through it step by step. So regardless of how you learn or how you want to learn, these are all excellent, have excellent tips. 
If you've got young children, the Nourishing the Early Years and Practical Magic are excellent for so many, there's just so much amazing stuff in these programs. I can't even tell you. Everything you ever need to know <laughs> is in these. So um, you get those as well as I'm including this year, my School for All Seasons Preschool and Kindergarten Curriculum. It's a 10-month guide and it's gonna come with this package. You'll get immediate access to that. And we'll be talking about this throughout the, um, uh, the months and I'm going to show you how to use it. That's one of the weeks that we're going to talk about and if you have any questions about it or need information, everything. It, this School for All Seasons is all inclusive, done for you, um, themed, weekly themes. It comes with a done for you circle time. It comes with songs that you can learn. It has verses. The circle time is already written out with all the verses. Um, stories included and all of that so it's a it's a total done for you it's based on nature and the festivals and the seasons um, there's no like learning to read or anything like that but it's just based on stories and nature and um, it's great it's a, it's one of my it, I think it is my best selling um, program I've ever done a school for all seasons so that you get included and for the first seven members who enroll you're going to get a 30 minute private session with me. We can talk about planning. We can talk about parenting. We can talk about whatever you want, whatever's going on. And you can take that call anytime that you want. We can do it right away. Or if you want to wait, you can wait during the year and take that. Uh, it'll sort of be your, uh, in your back pocket for whenever you really, really need it. So if you're one of the first seven enrolled, you get that. Um, it starts September 12th. Officially, uh, the first training rolls out, so you can go ahead and enrollment is open right now. This is it. I'm enroll. This is the very first enrollment. I'm opening it right now. Um, you can. I've tried to make this so affordable that anyone can do it because I know a lot of you are on smaller budgets and you can't afford anything that's too expensive. So I've tried to make it so doable. You can get in for thirty-seven dollars. And then just another $37, like it's over 12 payments you can enroll. So for $37 a month, you have me and all of my trainings, all of my guidance and knowledge, walking you through step-by-step step, through everything you're going to need to know about Waldorf through the, for an entire 12 months. So I made it as affordable as it could be. You can also do the full pay if you want to save a little bit. It's a better value and full pay is $387 and you're done. You've got everything included all ready to go. Um, okay, here is your materials and supplies bonus. Sorry, I'm running over a little bit. There's so much to cover here. Um, it's a bit.ly link. Sorry, I know it's not the most ideal here. So it's http bit.ly bit dot ly bit.ly. If you're watching on here, I'll send it also out in the replay to VR. S O F J. Hopefully you can see it on there. If you just click that link, it'll take you over to the materials and supplies bonus. And you can, it's got everything on there that you'll need to get your homeschool set up. The basics. I mean, there's always more stuff, but I want to say this is what you, you have to have, or you really, really need. Don't waste your time and money on other stuff, but these are the most important things to get. Again, that link, it's a bit.ly link, B I T dot L Y slash two V R. S O F J. So remember, as I'm wrapping up here, the system is already done for you. You do not have to create this all by yourself. You can end the frustration, the stress, and the waste of time, and we'll guide you through every step. So I'm not extra special. I'm nobody really, other than just a homeschooling mom who figured it all out. I just have a system that works, and I've done it for years and years. And it's worked with hundreds and really thousands of, of families going through my process. And if I can do it, you can do it too. So here it is, the waldorfconnection.com forward slash university. You can go over to that information page and see everything on there as well that's included and go ahead and click the link to enroll. You can get enrolled today for just $37. $37 is like a dinner, you know, a dinner out or a pair of jeans. <laughs> so for a pair of jeans, you can have everything you'll need to know all the programs and even your preschool kindergarten curriculum and everything ready to go for the next year. So um, I'm going to kind of move it on over to questions now. Let me, whoop. okay, here we go. Oh, great. Thank you. Somebody was asking how much if you pay it all immediately. Yeah. $387 if you want to do the full pay and that gets you, it does give you a little bit of a discount 
and then you're all said and done. And it does come with the, the preschool curriculum. And if you're one of the first seven, you get that um, 30 minute session with me. It's a the value of it is over $1,200. I don't think I said that, but it's on the page. There's so much stuff in there. I've tried to really set you up to where you, um, you can't fail. <laughs> like I try to give everything I can give in here to, um, to make sure that your success and you really can, um, you can do this and I will guide you through the whole year, um, as you learn. All right, let me go back and see what other kind of questions we've had here. Um, Empress said, I love the needle felting and want to learn more. Painting is intimidating to me as well as the music. Okay, great. And we'll be covering all of that. Um, painting is really fun. It looks intimidating, but it's, if you know the techniques of it, it's, it's actually quite simple. So um, they, they, those paintings look so beautiful and they do look intimidating, but they're actually quite fun to do and really not that hard at all if you know what you're doing. Uh, what's the name of the seasonal curriculum you mentioned? Oh, yeah, somebody else answered it's school for all seasons. Great um, Melissa said it's self-care is so important. You can't pour from an empty cup exactly you can't you can't keep going if you're if your gas tank is empty You've got to refill it yourself and, and keep yourself going so um, what other questions do you guys have? I know it's, we're gone over here a little bit, but is there anything else I can answer either about what we talked about today, um, about the university program? Um, okay, good, here's one. Victoria says, how about when you have a 12-year-old girl who has been in a regular school until now, but she wants to start homeschooling and you have a two-year-old toddler at the same time? That's a very great question. Yeah, so you've kind of got two, there's kind of two questions here. One is you've got a 12-year-old who's been to school and now you want to take her home and homeschool. So that's one thing. So, and especially coming into Waldorf at, with a 12 year old. So um, that's one thing. Um, if that's what you're talking about, let me know, Victoria, if, that, if that's your question, or is it more like, what do I do with my two year old when I have a 12 year old? Now you've got, your daughter is old enough that you can probably, you know, assign her some things, do the story, and, um, Having a two-year-old, I'm hoping that they still take naps. You've got to work around your two-year-old schedule because they're the young one. I would suggest having a special toy box or some kind of a um, basket that your two-year-old can only play with um, during school time that you're doing with your 12-year-old because your two-year-old's going to want to see what's happening, but they're not going to be able to do much, right, because they're really young. So create a special toy box or a basket of toys or maybe their own art supplies if they scribble a little bit and say, these are, it's going to only be used during school. And then you've got to try to work your, your, your daughter's school um, in between your two-year-old schedule when they're maybe when they're napping or go ahead and have them, you know, tell the story. Your child can listen or can run around a little bit, but you also have an old enough child who can do some things and not have to have you sit right there because they're 12. So you've got, a, it's better than having like a five-year-old and a two-year-old, if you will. Um, so if you want more information or you want to, um, if you want to um, ask a little bit more, Victoria, there, because, uh, oh, here, okay, let's see. Uh, it's both. Great idea. What about circle time with these two? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, when my kids got to be like in fifth grade, they were kind of looking at me about circle time that they didn't want to do it anymore. I would maybe do it with your two-year-old, but your 12-year-old may not want to join in, but she may because she's never done it. You may want to do something a little different. When my kids got a little older, we would take a walk and we would kind of do circle time during our walk. And with a 12-year-old, you can do a lot of um, mental math working with bean bags and spelling and that kind of thing right in the um, circle time. And your two-year-old, you might have to do a separate little thing with him or her um, because they're just learning to do maybe just a little, even two is kind of almost young to do a circle time, but they can start coming and singing. So you might even hold off and not do an official circle time until your, you know, your two-year-old's a little bit older, but you could still bring singing and things into the day um, with a walk where you all take a walk, a nature walk or something, or in the backyard, you could bring a couple things in. Um, but you know, you've got to be sensitive to your 12 year old that you don't want to make it too babyish. Um, 
because doing something aimed at a two-year-old is going to be a lot different than you would do to a 12-year-old. So you may have to break it up. And um, I know in Waldorf schools, they continue doing um, circle time, but that's because, you know, they've got a whole class and everyone's doing it. But I know my girls were kind of like circle timed out. And when we got to those ages, which I think is about where your, your daughter is, I changed it up a little bit and circle time became, um, you know, more about playing the recorder and, um, you know, I guess it just depends. You'll just have to kind of see if she's interested and she wants to do something. So I hope that helps. All right. Anybody else have a question? I don't want to go too much longer, um, but I don't want to ignore anybody else's questions here. If anybody has anything. Um, I'm going to go ahead and type in the chat box the link over to the university page. If you want to go, and it really that gives all the information and everything over there. So if you do have any questions about the university or aren't sure if it's right for you, you can email support at the WaldorfConnection.com and I'll be happy to um, talk to you or email back and forth or whatever to let you to see if I thought, if I think this is the right fit for you. Uh, oh, she's, Victoria says that's exactly what I was thinking. She probably doesn't want to do circle time. Thanks, Trent. Yeah, I, that's kind of what my thought would be, but you can start moving in it with the younger one. And, um, and you can just kind of work with her in a different way. Um, okay, you guys, well, I hope this helped. I tried to get, we got a lot, to, <laughs> we got a whole lot done here. Um, and I went through the six ingredients and tried to give you tips on, on everything. Um, it does kind of feel like a lot. It's not hard. It's just knowing what to do with each step. And that's why I think the university is an excellent tool for anybody. It's sort of a catch all, come in, learn how to do everything and um and you know just be ready to go so um okay i would like to enroll the university but can i do that in october instead or is it too late and we're enrolling right now so i think we're opening the enrollment up so i mean it doesn't really begin until september but if you're going to be like out of the country or behind or something it doesn't matter everything's recorded and you'll get those lessons and you'll have everything even if you just can't you know actually get started um until october but if you want to email me we can talk about it just email support at thewaterconnection.com. So, okay, great, you guys. Thank you so much. And I'm going to sign off. And um, I hope you enjoyed. And good luck on your journeys. I'd love to hear from you. And I hope some of you will join me over in the university this year. This is going to be our main program that I'm going to be doing. And I'm going to put everything I can into it and really give you everything you need so that you can be a success and really nourish your child and create this nourishing homeschool. All right. Until next time, you guys, thank you so much. I really appreciate it, and I will talk to you then.